it is so good to see you today that's right i'm talking to you welcome to the happiest place online welcome to feast at home my name is brother audie in case we haven't met i am your servant and i am your friend and i want to thank you for spending time with us today you know i really appreciate your presence my simple prayer for you is that your prayer request today will turn into a praise report this week that's right that god will show a solution to a big problem that you have been worrying about because you know the truth is my friends there are so many things that's fighting for your attention am i right your spouse wants your attention your kids want your attention your boss your business it wants your attention even your pet wants your attention but you know what god also wants your attention let me ask you this you want peace and joy and happiness in your life do you want it stop letting god fight for your attention instead what do you do you give it to him give god your attention before you expect something from god you give him your attention first all right sometimes the source of your stress it comes from giving attention to the wrong things give god the attention today and he will give you his peace god wants to give you his message today all right so i know that you are excited for a word from god so i'm not going to delay it any further let's say our favorite family family prayer all right here we go in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen i want you to do this with me open your hands come on lift your hands up in the air like you just don't care and then say this with me today i receive all of god's love for me Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's Word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do this together as a family. Everybody lift your hands in honor of God's Word. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Today we are on the second installment of our series, Rhythms of Grace. That's the title of our series. And here's the title for today, all right? A Road That Gives Rest. Whew, that's beautiful, right? I can already feel some of you who are so burdened right now. You're carrying a heavy load. God's about to set you free. Just a quick recap. That according to Matthew, there were three types of responses that people gave to Jesus. Positive, negative, and the third one was neutral. And we also said this, how John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, gave Jesus a negative response. He doubted his cousin Jesus. Why? All because he didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Let me say this, all right? One of the biggest reasons why we doubt God is because we don't understand God's ways, right? It's because we don't understand what God is doing. That's why we doubt God. That's why I love what the Proverbs say, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Gary V actually sings this. He says, Teach me to trust in you with all of my heart. Right? To lean not on my own understanding. All right, that's all you're going to get from me today. <laughs> that's actually the Audi V version. That's a beautiful prayer that you should always say, Lord, teach me to understand your ways. Teach me to trust in you and to lean not on my own understanding. And I pray that God's going to do that for you this week. Brother Bo preached on this so well last Sunday. He said that if you doubt God, guess what? God will never doubt you. That's good news to somebody here today. So after Jesus exalts John the Baptist. He said, there's no greater prophet than John. Even after John doubts him, this is where we find ourselves in the story, all right? I want you to open your Bible if you have one. And then I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. This is where we are. We're going to read from verse 20 all the way to verse 24. Okay? All together, let's read. Then Jesus began to denounce the town where we, he had done so many. Jesus had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. 
Verse 21, what sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, I'm going to preach about this in a, in a bit, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in sackcloth and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on judgment day than you. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did for you have been done in wicked sins, uh, Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. Hallelujah. This is God's word. We're going to study this today. But right now, I want to pray for you. Bow down your head. Close your eyes if that's comfortable. Let's pray. God, we invite you in this place where we are. Holy Spirit, we ask you to be the conductor of this symphony. Lord, preach your word today. Speak it so loud that everything in our life will, 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 will shift and will, will turn to you. Father, we pray for your wisdom above everything else, a wisdom of understanding so that we would, we would breathe in every word that is said so that we know where exactly to apply this in your life. Thank you so much, Jesus. We love you. We honor you. We exalt your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time, everybody. Let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Here's our big message for today. I hope you're ready for this, okay? It's going to sound a little bit radical. Some of you might not appreciate it right away, but I want you to listen this with a, to, to this with an open heart. All right, here it is. Your burden fits you well. That's right. To paraphrase this in Tagalog, bagay sa'yo ang burden mo. <laughs> oh, brother, Audie, that sounds so ridiculous. I know, but please, before you walk out on me, please give me a chance to explain, all right? In the gospel story that we're going to study today, Matthew says that Jesus performed many miracles in three Jewish towns, namely Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. That's, that's the three towns that Matthew mentions. But Matthew also mentions three Gentile towns called Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. Now take note of this, all right? These are three of the most notorious non-Jewish cities that were condemned by the prophets Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Why? All because of its wickedness and idolatry. Now take note, okay? There is not much in the Gospels that talk about the many miracles that Jesus did in Chorazin and Bethsaida. In fact, what happened there went undocumented by the disciples. Nobody mentions any of the things that Jesus did there. So we are kind of left right now to just speculate on what Matthew says in verse 20, that Jesus performed many miracles. That's what he said, right? Now, why am I preaching this? In the same way, many of God's many miracles in your life are also undocumented, right? In the sense that you don't always see how God protects you while you sleep right? You don't always see how God guards you against potential accidents. You don't always see how God provides the breath in your lungs every second. You see, most of God's miracles in your life, they're hidden. But what's important is that they are many. Amen. Somebody praise God right now and thank you, Lord, for your many miracles. Hallelujah. So, Jesus compares Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum to what? To Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. Now, if you were a Jew and you were living at that time, it was like Jesus was telling you, you are actually worse than the worst three cities of the world. That's what Jesus was saying. And that's harsh, right? I remember this movie, this 90s movie. Some of you might know this. And if you know this, you're probably my age. It's called My Best Friend's Wedding. It starts Julia Robert and Delmont Moroni. In, in this movie, Julia Roberts tries to sabotage the, the, the wedding of her best friend because she's so secretly in love with him. She tries to ruin his marriage, you know, the wedding itself. And when the best friend eventually finds out everything that she did, she apologizes by telling him, I'm, I'm so sorry, I am pond scum. And the best friend looks at her and, and he, he tells her, no, you are lower than pond scum. You are the pus that infects the mucus that cruds up the fungus that feeds on the pond scum. 
Ouch, right? That must have been the feeling that these people got when Jesus said to them that you are worse than the three worst cities of the world. But what was Jesus doing here? All right? He was actually calling them to do three practical things. I'm going to teach them to you, all right? I hope that these things are going to preach to you right now. Number one, Jesus was telling them, remove your masks. Let me give you a universal truth that you probably already know. Whether you agree or disagree with me, this is the truth. We all wear masks. How many of you agree with me? You get to a certain point in your life, a certain age, and you start learning how to put on these layers upon layers upon layers. And I'm not talking about makeup, ladies, okay? But layers of different personalities and different faces in front of people. In fact, the Japanese believe that we all have three kinds of different faces. The first face is the one that we show to the world, to the people who are not close to us. But there is a second kind of face, and that's the face that we show to our loved ones. The people who are, who are close to us, you know, our squad, the people we confide to. And then there's the third face. And the third face is not the face shield or the face mask, but the third face is your truest self. This is the face that only God sees. When you are alone in that place, in that room, in that corner, that's the face that God can only see. How do I know this? Because I'm not exempted from it, okay? And what's worse is that in order for us to look good and feel good, you know what we do? We compare ourselves to people who we think are worse than us. Like for example, we compare ourselves to criminals and rapists and, and plunderers and murderers and corrupt politicians. And then we say, oh, I am nothing like them. I haven't killed anybody, number one. I haven't stolen from anybody number two you know be careful when you do this because what happens is that you blind yourself from your bad side that's what the ancient Jews did you know they labeled Gentile cities like Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and then they said they're bad cities why did they do that so they could label themselves as a good city you know they used the bad in order to define the good in their own terms but you know in the process they only blinded themselves from their own evil you know, my dear friends, you need to know this. Evil is everywhere. I don't know if you have noticed this, but it's not just in our poor neighborhoods, but it's also in our rich neighborhoods. It's not just present in the old people, but it's also present in young people. I mean, evil is everywhere. Just look at social media. There is so much evil being masked in the form of hatred. You know, people hating on each other, people judging one another, people bullying and bashing each other, body shaming based on an image that, that's broken and limited on what the world thinks should be the ideal definition of what is good and pleasing. Evil is everywhere. Evil is also being masked in the form of pretension, right? People befriending pretending to be friends with someone, but when that person's back is turned, what happens? That's when the stabbing begins, right? We really need to stop this. You know, all this hatred, it's just dividing us. And this divisiveness is destroying us. It's destroying our country. It's destroying our governments. It's destroying families and neighborhoods and marriages and communities. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. Let me close this point. The truth is, it's easy to hate. It is such an easy thing to hate. You know what's hard? Loving someone who hates you. That's hard. Yet Jesus showed us that the path to heaven is not an easy one. He didn't choose the easy path. No, he chose the difficult path. He chose to love people, even the ones who hurt him, even the ones who hated him. In fact, Jesus says this, if you only love those who love you, what reward is there in that? Yes, it's easy to hate. Yes, it's so much harder to love. But it's in loving people who don't love you. That's where you reflect God's true nature. Because God is not a hateful God. Yes, God is a loving God. So here's my question. Who can you show the love of God to this week? Come on, try it out. Remove your mask. Be God's authentic love to somebody this week. All right? That's the first thing. Here's the second thing that Jesus was telling to the people of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Write this down. Don't play God. 
let me give you a little geography and history lesson, okay? Corinth in Bethsaida and Capernaum were fishing villages along the Sea of Galilee. And standing above these three towns was a mountain called Mount Arbel. Okay, Mount Arbel was one of the main headquarters of a Jewish rebel movement called the Zealots. Okay, that's not a dance group, but they were a rebel group called the Zealots. Now, these Zealots only had one goal. And that one goal that they had was to kick out all the Roman oppressors and then obliterate them from the face of the earth. That was their one goal, okay? And they were absolutely gonna do anything and everything, even massacre, you know, kill everybody. Uh, just to make that happen. Little trivia. Did you know that one of the disciples, one of the 12 apostles, uh, was part of that rebel group? Okay, his name is Simon. And I'm not talking about Simon Peter. Okay, I'm talking about Simon the Zealot. That's why he was named as such. So imagine, try to imagine this, okay? The tension in the room when Matthew, the tax collector, who, who, who worked for the Romans, who completely offended all the Jewish people, for the first time, he would meet Simon the Zealot. I bet Simon wanted to tear the head off of Matthew's shoulders, you know, off of his neck, and then use it as a footstool. But the Bible doesn't say anything that violent. You know, it didn't say that. Instead, he loved, he actually respected uh, Matthew. In the end, you know, they became great friends. Why am I saying this? Because that the power of Jesus. When the love of God and the grace of God fills your life and walks up into your life, He can turn your greatest enemy into your greatest friend. Amen, somebody. And I pray that the grace of God, this same grace, will work in your life this week. That somebody that you have been avoiding, you, your aversion to somebody will become an affection for that same person. That consumption will turn into compassion, or compassion, so to speak, okay? What is the importance of Mount Arbel to, the, to our story? See, the Zealots used Mount Arbel as their base where they would store their money and their weapons. And, you know, the three towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, I've been mentioning them all day. This is the place where they recruited the volunteers to, uh, to join their violent revolution against the Romans. So when Jesus showed up, you know, preaching this radical message to love your enemies, bless those who curse you. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, give him your left cheek. For them, it was too radical for them to listen to because by this time, they already invested too much in their hatred against the Romans. You know, they wanted the path to violence. They wanted blood to be shed in the streets. So they didn't actually listen to Jesus. They rejected the message of Jesus. But guess what? Jesus knew something that they did not. Jesus knew the consequences of what would happen. And true enough, in 70 AD, Roman general Titus and his army totally destroyed Jerusalem. You know, they, they completely obliterated Jerusalem. But here's the thing. Listen to this. Scholars believe that they actually did not need to do damage, a lot of damage to the city to destroy Jerusalem. Why? Because before they even conquered Jerusalem, the Zealots had already started destroying Jerusalem from within. How? They started killing fellow Jews who were not on their side. You know, yes, they got the blood. Yes, they got the violence. But in turn, think about this, they also got the consequences through the destruction of their beloved city. They wanted to save their nation, but instead they ended up destroying it. Let me preach this, my friend. There are consequences when you take matters into your own hands. In fact, you know, I believe that this is a relevant story that we're seeing today. You know, we're seeing people with the same race hating on each other. You know, let me just tell you this. When you let hatred fester inside of you, it'll destroy everything around you. It's like a cancer that eats away everything inside of you that there's very little that you could do on the outside. So don't get too lost in your hatred towards each other that eventually you start destroying yourself in the process, right? I'll close with this last story, okay? One time when Jesus was being apprehended by the Romans to be tried and eventually to be crucified. Peter, he wanted to kill the apprehending Roman soldier. But Jesus stopped him and Jesus said this, 
Put away your sword, Peter. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. You know what this means? This means that your chosen weapon of destruction will be the same weapon that will destroy you. So question, what is your greatest and most dangerous weapon? I'm going to answer that by asking another question. How do you know when you're already playing God? You know, when you're already at a dangerous level thinking and pretending that you are God, here's the answer. When your ego or your pride gets too big. See, when your head gets too big, you're not going to fit inside a door anymore. And when you walk around with a bloated ego, you start behaving and thinking like you are God. You know, you start thinking that it's all about you. The ego is your most dangerous weapon. And when you use ego as your weapon, guess what? That same ego will destroy you because violence begets violence. So what do you do? You learn how to tame and soften your ego. Those who are not attached to ego, they always win. How? They have more peace. For one thing, you know, they have a more genuine love for God and a more authentic love for themselves. That's what happens when you tame your ego. So yes, I know you want to fight back. You know, just like Peter, you want to fight back. But you know what? It doesn't take a lot of faith to fight back. You know what requires faith? Not fighting back. Believing that God will fight for you. So let God fight the fights that are not fightable right now. Fights that are wearing you down. Okay, let him God fight means that you're surrendering the outcome to his divine justice. Let go of your ego. Instead, let humility be your greatest weapon because with humility, it's possible to walk away from a fight and still win the victory. How? Because with humility, there is always victory. Okay, stop playing God. Stop taking matters into your own hands. Stop defining good and evil according to your terms. Why? Because it doesn't fit you. Your burden fits you well. In other words, bagay sa yo ang burden mo. I know, it's like, Brother Bo, what are you talking about? Hindi masyadong inspiring yan. I'm telling you, if you chew it and understand this word, it will be one of the most inspiring things you've heard in a long, long while. Hi, this is Bo Sanchez and welcome to the feast. And Audi gave an amazing, powerful message. And today, I just want to continue with the third thing that Jesus was asking the people from Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum to do. First, he said, what did he say? Remove the mask. Number two, don't play God. The third thing, and this is what I want to talk about, the third thing that Jesus wants these people to do and the, what Jesus wants us to do is to get real rest. Yes! Now, what does that mean? Get real rest. I want you to answer these two questions. Number one, number one, what is the heaviest burden in the world? The heaviest burden of all the heaviest burdens that you, you think and, and you feel you've, you've carried. The answer, taking matters into your own hands, playing God. Defining good and bad in your terms. That's the heaviest burden. Question number two. What is the greatest rest you can ever, ever have? Answer. Taking matters into God's hands. Surrendering to the Lord all your fears and all your worries and following Jesus all the way. This is what Jesus said. Let's read that passage. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Isn't that amazing? Oh, friends, this is what Jesus was saying. But then, Look at what he said. He said, I will give you rest. And it's almost like, you know, we're expecting Jesus to say, take a break, take a vacation, drop everything, go to Barakai. He didn't say that. He said this, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. 
It's almost like a downer. It's almost like, you know, I will give you rest and our hopes are up. And then he says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And, uh, what's that? A yoke is a wooden crossbar that two oxen are supposed to carry for plowing. That doesn't sound very restful. But the key word is together. What does that mean? I hope you're listening because this is powerful. My next statement is powerful. You, my friend, are not supposed to carry your burden alone. No, no, God. He's supposed to carry that burden with you. Jesus will carry that burden with you. I hope you're listening. I want you to put your hand over your chest and I want you to say that with me. I will never carry my burden alone. God will carry it with me. And I want you to declare it that, you know, I will never carry that burden alone. God will carry it with me. God will carry it with me. I want you to tell somebody beside you, if you're, if you're, if you're attending the feast with a family member or a friend, you know, slap that person in the back and, and say, God will carry my burden with me. You were not designed by God to carry your burden alone. No wonder people are going through all sorts of crisis and, and all sorts of psychological problems is because they're trying to carry the burden alone. And here's the other thing. That, you know, I, I just want to say this. I, I, I really believe this is powerful. A lot of people think that rest, it's about not doing anything. No, no. Not doing anything is meaninglessness, emptiness, death. Believe me, I have, I have met some people, I have seen, I know of some people who after retirement drop dead or almost drop dead because there was nothing to do. The concept of rest and not, not doing anything, it's wrong. I'm, I'm telling you, this is, this, is, this is real, you know. You get drained. I get drained, not because of too much work. No, we get drained because we lack two things, purpose and relationships. I hope you're listening. My next statement will be powerful and I want you, promise me, please promise me you're gonna chew on this next statement that I'm gonna share with you today. Are you ready? Here it is. Rest, real rest, is carrying with God your God-assigned burden and surrendering everything else into his hands. You and I, we have a God-assigned burden. And my question is this, are you carrying what God never intended you to carry? And the reason why you are carrying that burden that was never assigned for you to carry is because you were playing God because you were defining good and bad in your own terms. Instead of putting matters into God's hands and following Him, you've taken matters into your own hands. There's this other thing that, that Jesus is not yet through. It, this is wild. We're, we're just breaking this, this breaking and unpacking this one verse He was saying, and each, each word uh, just reveals powerful stuff. He said, I will give you rest, we got that covered. Take my yoke upon you. We got that. And then the next line, he says, for my yoke is easy. Now, modern people, we don't understand that. Like, my yoke is easy. What's that? But ancient people would have gotten that really quickly. Jesus was a carpenter. And his main trade was farming tools. That, that, that's what he was doing. He would be the guy, the expert in building yokes. So I want you to imagine Jesus standing at the door of his carpentry shop. And the sign above says, my yoke fits well. Now, where, where does that come from? The original Greek, in the original Greek language, the, the words, and my yoke is easy, is translated as my yoke fits well. Ancient people would have gotten it immediately because in ancient times, you would buy an, uh, a yoke for your ox 
in the same way that we modern people would buy a suit from a tailor. No joke. If you wanted a yoke for your oxen, what, what you do is you bring your ox to the carpenter and he measures your ox and then you go home. And after a few days, you come back with your ox for a fitting session. <laughs> That's right. The yoke is fit and, and, and tried out by your ox. And I can, you know, my imagination, of course, being very imaginative, I'm imagining uh, the ox in front of a full view mirror and saying, it's too tight in the middle. I think I need to do some, uh, what do you call that? IF? That IF? Yeah? Uh, intermittent fasting? <laughs> okay, never mind. Please forgive me. Bear with my craziness. All right, so, so that, that's what's happening here. He, the, the, the carpenter is trying his best that the yoke should fit perfectly the ox so it would not grate on the shoulder or blister on the neck. My dear friends, I, I hope you're listening to what I'm going to preach to you that Jesus... He fits you perfectly. Bagay na bagay si Jesus sayo. The burden, the, the God-assigned burden that He is giving to you, your mission of following Him and serving Him and, and loving Him and obeying Him, it fits you. Bagay na bagay sayo si Jesus. Can I, can I share a little bit uh, more personally? Um, my wife, um, like many normal people, would have her normal bouts of low self-worth. And many times in our marriage, she would just come up to me and she would ask me this question with, with, her, with her, you know, um, what do you call that? Oh, gosh, I, I forgot. It's like... It's like um, um, you know, you know that, that cat with, with, with those big eyes and, and you, oh, you know, that, that, kind, that kind of look. I, I, I forgot the, how you call that. But she would, she would look, give me that look and she would say, Love, nagsisisi ka na ba na ako pinili mo? You know, or, do you regret um, that, that you chose me? And, and I would, you know, I would... It's, we've been married for 22 years. So I'm used to this. You know, she would, she would ask me that question and I would say, I'd remind her and, uh, and affirm her and say, Sweets, you are the best thing that has ever happened to me. But there are days when she would modify the question and she would say, Love, feeling ko, Pabigat ako sa'yo. I am a burden to you. Hindi ba you wanted to be a single missionary before I met you? You know, that was your goal. And then, and then I came along and, you know, you, 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 you felt that God wanted you to get married and you believed that. But, but how about now? Do, do, do you sometimes feel that I'm just a burden to you? And I looked at her and I would answer in this way, yes, you are a burden to me. Of course, that was not the answer that she was expecting. So she frowned <laughs> and pouted. And I said, you are my happy burden. And I love you. And I would never would want to live my life without this happy burden. Because I have chosen this life with you as the happiest version of my life. And I, I, I wanted to share this with you because I believe that a lot of people are not happy because they do not carry their happy burden, their God-assigned burden in their life. Listen to me. Marriage is supposed to be a happy burden. Parenting is supposed to be a happy burden. Ministry is very, very difficult, but it is a happy burden. B working in your job, in your business, in your livelihood is difficult, but it is supposed to be a happy burden. You're tired at night. You're tired before you go to sleep, but you're happy. And at the end of the day, following Jesus is difficult, 
Don't, don't try to kid yourself. Loving God is supposed to be difficult. Obeying Him is supposed to be difficult. Living for your mission and, and shining the light of God in your daily life is supposed to be difficult. But it is a happy burden. And bagay na bagay sayo si Jesus. He fits you well. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.